Hi everyone, I am so excited about today's podcast episode. I talked to someone who is following me and we started talking through direct message and I found out that a podcast episode that I'd previously recorded literally changed his life. I was so excited um, and just so happy for him and to know that this podcast has such an influence. So I invited him to be on the show. And the reason why it had such an influence on him, he listened to a prior podcast with Jeffrey Hunter where he talked about starting a wildlife career at 40. So this person, Ron Lewis, he actually started his wildlife career at 49. So we talk about what it's like to transition when you're older to a wildlife career from a previous career, how he did it. And then we also just talk about tips in general for going into this career. And he has a lot of really great advice, including a tip I didn't know about that I would, I'm definitely going to be sharing with my students from now on. But before we jump into the podcast, I wanted to tell you guys about this challenge that is coming up. It's in the beginning of June. I think it starts June 7th. It's the Getting a Job in Wildlife Biology Challenge. It's going to be five days full of trainings and exercises that will make you ultra competitive for getting a job in this field. I have helped dozens of students now. I've mentored dozens of students in my professional career. I know exactly what it takes to get a job. So we're gonna be doing this every day for five days. I think it'll probably run an hour a day and there'll be exercises and I will give you the details on what will make you super competitive. So if you are so sick and frustrated of applying to job after job after job and getting rejected, don't keep doing the same thing because it's not going to work. There is a real strategy behind getting these jobs. Ron and I talk a little bit about that, but I go really into depth with that into this challenge, telling you exactly what you need to do. So go to fancyscientist.com, sign up, you'll see it at the menu at top. Okay, let's get to the interview with Ron. Hi, Ron. Thank you so much for joining me on the Fancy Scientist podcast. How are you today? I'm doing excellent. Thank you. Great day, it's it's sunny. Oh, it's 88? No, it's sunny. It was raining all day yesterday. Okay. (laughs) It's like 88. (laughs) Wow. Where are you? Uh, uh, I'm in Rutherford, Idaho. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Okay. So you're coming to us from Idaho. There's a little bit of a lag, so I'll remember to account for that. Okay. So I reached out to you um, through Instagram. We just started having a conversation and Mm -hmm. the really interesting thing about you or what really piqued my interest was that you are 49 and you said that you got your first wildlife job recently. Is that correct? Kind of correct. I just turned 50, which is uh, another... (laughs) <laughs> Yay, congratulations. Which, it's awesome. Oh, yeah. Thank you. It's awesome. Yeah. Getting older is great. Let me tell you. Um, I am on my second wildlife job. I okay. just started in Idaho. Yeah. And uh, last year I worked for uh, Washington Fish and Wildlife. And this year I'm working for Idaho Fish and Game. And I just thought that was was so interesting because in our field, there's, or for people going into our field, especially people transitioning who want to transition, there's a really big misconception that you're too old or it's too late for them. And obviously you're a case of where that's not true. And I also interviewed uh, Jeffrey Hunter before and, um, and he, well, he actually was the reason why you, why you decided yeah. to really go for it, wasn't it? Can you, yeah. so can you yeah. tell us about, about your, about what made you finally decide at 49 that you're going to pursue a wildlife career? So uh, back in October, 2020, I was uh, laid off from uh, my job and uh, after 20 nearly 25 years and I was ready to leave anyways. And, and I was contemplating retirement, uh, young retirement at that age anyways. So they kind of, when they forced me out, um, 
it was a blessing in disguise, really. Uh, I remember the next day I felt when I woke up, it was an amazing feeling. I felt like I can literally do whatever I want. And, and I felt so much energy and excitement because I could write my own path now. I don't have to get up at 3.30 in the morning and make my coffee, and drive into work, fight with traffic, you know, do all the engineering stuff that I was doing. And then drive home, be tired, and 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 not wanting to do uh, the things that I wanted to do outside of work. So I decided to retire. And after a short time, um, I got bored. <laughs> I had too much time on my hand. So I got uh, uh, back in 2008, 2009, when uh, the recession uh, was going on. I contemplated going back to school then and becoming a biologist. And I, said, and I told myself, if they ever lay me off, I'm going to, I'm, that's what I'm going to do. And they never did. I kept working. And then I kept thinking about that, though, uh, during my retirement. And I decided to look into it. So I, I looked into it, looked into it, looked at different schools. And then I, I found you, found your podcast. And then I saw the podcast uh, with, uh, or heard it, with uh, Jeffrey Hunter. And I remember about halfway into it, I knew what I was going to do. I knew exactly what I was, I was going to do it. I was going to jump in and I, and that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's breath. I just left forward, made the commitment right then and there. And then, uh, and then haven't looked back. That's so awesome. I'm so happy for you. Wow. Waking up at three 30. Now you say you'll never have to do that again. It depends on what animal you study. <laughs> if you're doing birds, you might have to wake up really early. <laughs> So you then had your first job at, at 49. Can you tell us about or your first wildlife job at 49? Can you tell right. us about um, getting that job? Like what was what was the process like and how difficult right. or easy was it for you? Um, well, I was very overwhelmed in the beginning. I had no clue what I needed to do. Um, I, I had zero experience other than personal, you know, going out hiking or whatever or handling my own wild, I'm a hunter so or fisherman as well. And so just handling animals personally was the only experience that I ever had. Uh, so I just literally, I went, uh, just started applying for, you know, entry level jobs um, anywhere you know, that would take me. I just, I just started doing a little research and, and then I, there was a big advertisement that came out. I think it was on LinkedIn from Washington Fish and Wildlife, they were desperate need for people to go out and, and clip fins for salmon. Uh, brief, I don't know, a lot of people, a lot of your listeners probably don't understand uh, that part of it, but uh, uh, hatchery salmon uh, have to have their adipose fin clipped and, uh, and there's literally millions of them that get clipped um, and they have people <laughs> hold these little juvenile, small little tiny salmon and they clip the little tiny fin that's near their uh, near the tail, and they clip it off with a pair of scissors, and then back out into the hatchery pen, and then they get released out into the river and then live their life. So they were looking for volunteers to actually do that. And I thought, well, here's an opportunity. It's right down the road from my house. It's only 15 miles away, and I can get some experience there. You know, so mm -hmm. I I called them up, I interviewed, they gave me the job because they were desperate, and then I started a week later, and then. I worked it for two weeks, and then, uh, and then within that two-week period, I leveraged that knowledge that I, hey, I, I'm working for Washington Fish and Wildlife, you know, as a temporary, mm -hmm. and then uh, Washington State Parks uh, gave me a call because they were in desperate need of people to, to work, and and then they ended up hiring me. Now, if you're 16, 17 years old, 18 years old. This probably is not going to happen to you. I had the benefit of working for many, you know, nearly 30 years in an mm -hmm. engineering background. So that helped out a lot, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But they took a chance on me and then, and, and I leveraged that experience uh, work, working for Washington State Parks. And it's a simple job. It wasn't even that hard. And leveraged that job to get, finally get the job for Washington Fish and Wildlife, which I worked up until October of last year. And I leveraged that job to get the job I'm at today. And are you at a full-time job then today? Cause I, cause yeah. you're still in school, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. All these jobs have been full-time. Yeah. That's great. And, um, 
can you tell us about your your previous career and right. how you used that to leverage these new jobs like how how are you able to um, transfer some of those skills over or show that because you right. could do this, you can do this in the wildlife field. Right. Um, <clears throat> so actually talking with the biologist I'm working with now, um, one of the things he's told me that uh, a lot of biologists, it, this, these are for seasonal jobs, tech jobs and whatnot. Um, there are in desperate need of individuals that um, are mechanically inclined, understand what a wrench is um, and whatnot can, if they're left alone somewhere that they can solve a problem, run a chainsaw, uh, be able to use hand tools of some sort to get themselves out of trouble. What if, what if your boat breaks down in the water? What are you gonna do? Or if, you know, if you're in fisheries, mm -hmm. uh, what if you, you know, if something happens to you? So you need, you need to have the initiative uh, uh, to be able to remain positive and, and, and understand uh, how to get out of situations if, if, if they were to get back. And that's what they were looking for. So being an engineer, I was a manufacturing engineer for many years. Um, I understood all of that stuff and I could, I could build machines, I could tear them apart and, and whatnot. So that's the, that's the type of person they wanted. Yeah, I was older, uh, a little more mature. Um, and so they, they liked that as well. But I'm working with a kid that's 22 years old, just graduated uh, college and, and as a fisheries technician. And he's same thing, very hands-on and understands tools, um, can get himself out of a jam if needed. Um, and that's what they're looking for. And that's what they want. And they can teach you the fishery stuff. I remember the biologist said this specifically to me. I can teach you anything about fisheries. I can't teach you uh, how to, how to uh, you know, get yourself out of a jam if you're all by yourself. You know, you gotta, you gotta already know how to do that. So if you're new to this, uh, young, uh, get, get your experience outside of, of uh, you know wildlife biology, uh, you know help help out your your dad with the you know changing the oil in the car or mowing lawns, you know stuff like that. So you understand how things work, and then uh, plus you get paid to do it too. So doing you know, that kind of stuff. Wow, that's surprising. I've never heard that kind of advice, or not surprising, but that's that's interesting. I've yeah. never heard that advice before, but it does make. A lot of sense and when mm -hmm. looking at the job postings you do see a lot of um requirements like four-wheel drive is another big one yeah. um so how how can so you mentioned like um you know volunteering with your dad or something is there do you think mm -hmm. there's a more like official way or um like a well, there's a, a lot of clubs mm -hmm. i'm sorry there's a lot of no, clubs uh, yeah um so there's, there's like, you mentioned uh, like ATV driving and whatnot. How do you get that experience? If you don't own an ATV or none of your friends own an ATV, mm -hmm. well, there's, there's clubs. You can contact the clubs and believe me, many clubs, they want to expand their club, make it bigger, more popular. They will be more than willing to help you, <laughs> uh, you know, it's to get that experience. And so uh, I, uh, there's a, another biologist that's working uh, seasonally. And then, and then in the winter time when there's, when he's not working, what he does is that he works as a butcher. And he specifically wants to work as a butcher because that's going to give him a skill set of understanding the anatomy of uh, an animal, you know, with a fish or in this case, his case, beef or, or deer, you know, because he, he helps out uh, uh, with during hunting season and stuff like that to butcher animals and stuff. So that gives him a skill set that a lot of, I mean, I, I've never worked as a butcher, but that's a great skill set that a lot of people that um, should have, you know, because when you are doing a necropsy on an animal, right? If you're a butcher, you're going to know exactly what, you're not going to be grossed out. You're not going to be, you know, kind of disgusting and stuff. And you're, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be second nature to you, you know? So, mm -hmm. so find a skill set that's, you can get better at that's easy to, to learn and just do it figure out a way why do you think the the agencies that you worked for had such a hard time finding people you, you said they were in desperate need do you right. and and um if you belong to the the facebook wildlife groups there's two big facebook groups but especially the wildlife mm -hmm. science career network you see a lot of postings there about people who can't get jobs 
So why, why did they have a hard time finding people? Was it that um, they couldn't find people with the right skill set or just people weren't applying? I think it's a combination of both. Um, I think COVID has really changed the way uh, people view a job now. Um, hmm. And it did for me. Um, I think people would rather do something they really want to do. So there's a lot of people that maybe struggle to get a, in at a wildlife job. And now they're, they've kind of, are, they found a new love and they're, they ventured off somewhere else. So a lot of those people that were doing those kind of jobs aren't doing it anymore because they don't want to do it anymore. You know, mm-hmm. they're doing something else. And then again, the skill set of individuals that are applying are low, you know? Uh, so mm-hmm. when you have a low talent pool, you're going to, uh, you, uh, you know, a lot of the bottom feeders are going to be there but the high quality candidates are, are not, you know? So for me, as a high quality candidate in one field, and I go to a shift over to do a, a different field, you know, even though I don't have any experience, but I do have a lot of qualifications that they're looking for outside of the actual you know, job, if, if you will. But they can teach me that, you know? And then, and then that's what they're doing, you know? And it's not difficult. It really isn't. I mean, I, uh, it literally takes one day or a couple of days of training and then uh, the bio is just showing you what you need to do and then you got it right and you actually get more proficient you get better at it and then you move on to something else and you learn something else you know so the job itself isn't isn't difficult at all um but finding the right skill set uh that biologists want uh especially for seasonal jobs um uh, they've been struggling like he uh, he gave me an example one time uh, they had an electrical problem uh, on the fish trap, and he uh, asked the technician he was working with. He said, "Hey, can you go get me a, some channel lock pliers out of the toolbox so I can fix this?" And the kid came back with a screwdriver. He didn't understand. <laughs> Even I know that that's the wrong tool. <laughs> I, but it was an example he brought. He's like, the kid brought back the screwdriver. He's like, "What? That's not what I need." He didn't understand what, what what to do or understand tools at all, you know. But that was, you know, believe it or not, we had the, my first week there uh, with this job, uh, our fish trap broke and we had a, we, we have this plate and it, you know, it's riveted, to, you know, the little things, the rivets holding it together. Well, it broke and we, and we couldn't do anything. And so the guy I'm working with, um, he's mechanically inclined. So we, we ended up having to rig it up and, and fix it. We had to fix the problem, you know, um, cause we were two hours away from civil civilization, you know? So mm-hmm. we had to do it. We had just had to figure it out and we did it. So the biologist was happy. He didn't have to drive all the way in and, and help us out and, and figure out the problem and how to solve it. So that's what they're looking for. So when you have low talent pool with bottom beaters that don't have any skill set or don't care, you know, they're not going to hire those people. So. Do you think they just don't know to have those skill sets or you, or you really think they don't I think, care? I think a lot of them don't know they need to have that skill set. Yeah. They're so focused, you know, they're, they're tunnel vision, if you will. So if you look at, uh, well, at least the ones I've been looking, at, I don't know if it's every state agencies like this, but the ones I've been looking at, they gave you a list of qualifications, the minimum qualifications and preferred qualifications, right? Mm-hmm. So the minimum qualifications, they, you know, which a lot of people qualify for, but the preferred is, is kind of what they're really looking for. Mm-hmm. And that's what they really want to know. So if you look at all of them and you, if you can get this, you just take, look at several jobs, take, take notes on what the, what, what, you know, what are they looking for? All these different jobs. What, what's kind of the trend? What are they looking for? Write it down and try to get that experience. Um, and then you can put it on your resume. That's exactly what I teach my students. I, I, mm-hmm. I help them dissect jobs and I ask them to look for like, like there's usually at least three trends. Um, if you get more advanced level positions, maybe four or five right. or four or themes, like you look for like, what are the, what are the main things that they, they want? And right. I'm so glad you brought up that example of um, somebody or you being stuck you know, having to fix a problem two hours away right. from civilization. It reminds mm-hmm. me of, um, and you're, well, you're right that they want people who can solve problems. And it reminds me of when I was an intern with the Bureau of Land Management, 
we um, had um, one of the, we, we were deployed in groups of two and I worked with another intern and he was actually older. I think um, I think he pro actually was probably late 40s or maybe 50s and he mm -hmm. was still in school. And then we went out together with um, somebody who graduated with their you know biology degree and we went to um, look for water catchments to see if it was there and we had to go to this gps location and this mm -hmm. was in um southwest utah so there were a lot of like canyons and things yeah. and we were trying to get from a to b and the the young biologist was saying oh we can just like you know take like more of a straight path there and the older intern was saying no like we can't do that we're gonna have to like you know like go around and take this really long path and i was kind of like the decider because they couldn't agree and i didn't know what i was talking about and i was like well this person has their biology degree you know they're trained so we followed um the younger biologist and the older intern was right we ended up having to backtrack and like go all the way around because there was like a gigantic canyon that we couldn't see and we couldn't get down it was too narrow so you're right they want people yeah. who can who can think on their feet plan not panic right. so for the the 22 year old that you work with do you know how he um like emphasized on his resume or his cover letter that he's that type of person is it just like the mechanical skills that he has or is there was there something well, else that or she did was it he yeah so he he um he actually got hired during COVID uh, in 2020 for a different job, um, but during the interview process and whatnot. And so his his professor, uh, the, the biologist, reached out to the professor, "Hey, tell me about this kid," and said, "Hey, this is one of the best students I've ever had. Great kid." So mm -hmm. that alone uh, was the selling point to the biologist. I'm going to hire this kid. So he hired him. COVID hit, can't have a job anymore. So they they cut the job out. And then when when this job opened up, they needed two positions. I got one, and they immediately asked this kid, "Hey, you want to, you want to, you want this job?" And you know, of course, he'd accepted, and and, and here he is today. So, uh, in that case, you know, it was the professor, his professor, that kind of sold the biologist and said, "Hey, hire this guy. He's, you know, he's he's good." But getting to know him, things Mason, he's a great kid. Um, you know, he's he's worked construction jobs in high school. Uh, he's worked at a pizza joint, so he's customer service, right? Uh, mm -hmm. He's he's guided on on rivers for for rafting, and he just got his guide license for fishing, so he's going to be doing that this this summer as well. So he's he's really putting himself out there and making himself uh, available. Uh, one one, he's making himself feel uncomfortable, right? So he's getting in uncomfortable situations to where he'll be forced to learn, right? And, and get mm -hmm. better at something, which is good, which is what you want, right? So, and, you know, I don't know what his future aspirations are. I don't know if he really wants to be a biologist, but right now he's happy and content with what he's doing. He gets to move around the country and do all, all these great, great things. Um, but at the same time, he's gaining experience wherever he goes, you know, different mm -hmm. experiences. And that's what a lot of employers, whether it's an agency or uh, a private company, that's what they want, right? They, they want people that mm -hmm. have a lot of experience and aren't afraid to do things, new things, for sure. Mm -hmm. And so before you made your your transition into this career, like I know you heard mm -hmm. my podcast, but what, what was preventing you from going in it sooner like like because you said you were kind of forced to retire early so why why didn't you just go into it what was holding you back uh i was comfortable i mean yeah i was getting paid really well um i had good insurance you know every it was i was just comfortable right i, I didn't mm -hmm. have to you know i liked my job you know I was, uh, yeah, um, it was challenging um I, I was getting burnt out with it it was breaking my body mm -hmm. down my hands weren't working the same anymore you know handling stuff steel or, or tools all over day you know over time that breaks you down right um mm -hmm. and i just i couldn't force myself to leave because i was comfortable where i was at mm -hmm. you know and, and when they when they pushed me out you know they they we had 120 people in our department and they got rid of 110 of us right 
Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was quite a bit. Um, it was a slaughter is what we called it. And a lot of good people, um, they're all older. They're all at the top of the pay grade, which is where I was at. You know, the, you know, the company was trying to save money. They were bleeding money big time because of, you know, COVID uh, mm -hmm. had a huge impact. And, you know, and, and, and it was a great thing for me, you know, it was a great thing for the company. They saved money, you know, obviously, but it was, mm -hmm. a, ended up being a great thing for me and a lot of other people too, because it opened up doors, other places. So getting mm -hmm. fired from somewhere or laid off in my case, isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's actually a good thing. I, I totally yeah. agree with that. I a hundred percent agree. Um, but what, so when, once you got laid off, what, how come, how come then you weren't like, oh, okay, I'm going to go back to school now and do a wildlife oh. biology career. Why, why the, why the pause? <laughs> Are you comfortable to there? Uh, well, <laughs> when you, well, I mean, at my age, I mean, at the time I was 48, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, God, I really want to go back to school with a bunch of 18 year old kids. I mean, my kids are, you know, at yeah. the time they were like 14 and 15. You know, God, they're just a couple of years old. It uh -huh. just seemed kind of weird. And I didn't, and then because of COVID, I mean, COVID had a lot of silver linings to it. And it was bad, obviously, but it yeah. had a lot of silver linings to it because it forced a lot of companies and schools to adapt and change, right? So a lot of schools uh, went online. I mean, uh, uh, Oregon State is one that comes up top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, they, they have one of the best online programs uh, in the country. For wildlife mm -hmm. biologists, you know, based off the research I've done, uh, somebody somebody's going to have to verify this on their own. But based on my research, they were the best. And then there's a bunch of other. Harvard has online schooling. You know, I think pretty mm -hmm. much every every university has some sort of online schooling now because of that. And so I and so that intrigued me more. So if, if they didn't have online schooling, I don't know where I'd be today. I don't I don't I don't know. You know maybe I would say retired. Maybe I just I don't know. Who knows? It doesn't matter anyways, because it's a moot point. Um, but with the online schooling, that that propelled me to go ahead and make the leap. And then you chose Unity, right? For oh, yes, I yeah, I chose Unity. I had narrowed it down to three. Um, I was first of all, let me caveat this. I was a horrible high school student. I, mm -hmm. I was not. I didn't care about school, which is <clears throat> my fault mostly. Uh, not that I think back on it. I didn't have anybody pushing me to do better. So anyways, being a horrible uh, high school student hurt me uh, to get into Oregon State because uh, they went off my high school transcripts. And I even wrote, wrote them a letter, gave them a story, say, hey, look, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not that kid anymore. I'm way different. This is what I've done. And, and they still said, no, that's the school I really wanted to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, Unity College, uh, they liked me and they said, yeah, sure. You know, we'll take you. Um, and it's been great. It's a great, great college. I've, uh, it's, it's, I don't have any thing to compare it with, you know, cause this is mm -hmm. the only college I, I can go. So as far as I'm concerned, it's fine. Um, I also applied to Prescott, which is, I got accepted there as well, but that's in Arizona. That was more of a artsy school, which I found mm -hmm. out later. So I didn't, but yeah, unity has been great. I like it. Yeah, I ask you that because I see on on the Facebook group like every once in a while people ask about Unity College. So I was just curious mm -hmm. um, what you thought of it. And it seems like, can, or can you tell us? Do your do your employers say anything about it, or like you know, versus online being in person? Do they seem to have an opinion about that? Uh, 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 definitely in person would probably be better. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, I think the, the engagement with uh, your classmates and and and. Uh, and professors and whatnot i think would be better i think overall being in there in, i mean if you look at the high school level when, when my kids were online when they when they were in high school they they suffered uh just doing strictly online yeah when they're back in school not that they're my my son's a senior my daughter's a junior now and they are thriving you know they're they're doing great you know they they really like it um, they're doing the grades are a lot better. Uh, they're more focused and everything else. So if you are going to do online schooling, you got to be focused. You got to You got to want to do it. Um, uh, cause it's hard. Cause you, you're pretty much self-disciplined to do everything, right? If you're mm -hmm. in class with other students, right. You have the peer group around you and then you're going to be held accountable with a lot of, a lot of your friends or other students mm -hmm. and your professors. So. If you have a chance, if you're young and you and you want to go to college, 
I would skip the online and I would go in person. If you're older like me, um, and don't want to be around a bunch of kids all the time. <laughs> I don't say that meanly. I just, when you get older, you, you know, you want, you want, you want to be around people around your age, you know, um, I would try the online thing and see if you like it, you know, and, but you got to be committed to it because it's not cheap, you know, you don't get yeah. much of a, much of a break, you know, you know oh, the price differences aren't that they're not that different. Not much of a difference. No, no, you're going to mm, be spending surprising. a lot of money what, either, either direction you go. So, um, the online option to you is nice for people that want flexibility as well. Like they, you know, right. they have to work and they can do it on weekends right. or, or at least I think there's options to, to do it that way. Um, but going back to being older and going back to school, a lot mm -hmm. of people worry about going, being uh, too old to go back to graduate school. And that is mm -hmm. also a misconception. When I was in graduate school, I was one of the youngest people, honestly, I, I went when I was, mm -hmm. I think 25 or 26. And most people are, I think started in their late twenties or thirties. Um, we had at least two people in their forties. So, um, so yeah, it's not just, you know, people right out of college. And, um, part of that is because of the experience, they want people who have experience that's really important in our field and that it's not mm -hmm. just, the academics. Um, and so no, definitely for, not. for so many, I've been looking at a lot of resumes. So many people emphasize the courses they take. And it's like the first thing they list. Like, and I always say, don't, you know, don't do that. Like nobody, nobody really cares what courses you take. As long as you have the degree and you meet, like you said, that basic qualification, that's yeah. fine. Maybe there are some positions that care, but I would say the majority don't. And they want your experience, if you're experienced that, that trumps, um, everything. Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, uh, I keep referring to my boss, my biologist that I work with. Um, but he's, he's very talkative and he, and he'd be a great guy to have on your podcast. He really would. Okay. He's a talker. Oh yeah. I could hook you up. Yeah, sure. Do, I'd I love to. probably would too. Um, but I remember he told me, he goes for, for, the, for a lot of these jobs, bachelor's degree is just fine the problem is is that everybody's going out and getting master's degrees and phds so why yeah. wouldn't you hire somebody with that a more of an education right so it's, that's why it's so difficult for people if you want to be a biologist or what any field really i mean you don't have to be biology uh, a biologist could be any field. if you have a, a couple candidates that have this similar background uh for uh, work experience one's got a four-year degree and the other one's got a you know master's degree why wouldn't you take the guy with the master's degree or gal, you know? So that's the challenge, you know, but, um, networking, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think we really talked about that yet. Uh, networking mm -hmm. is, is huge, uh, in any field. Um, if you, if you want to move forward in any, this is for any career. If you want to move forward in any career, you got to create a professional network. Um, it's going to help you in the long run. Um, the people you associate yourself with, um, if they're not making you better, then you probably shouldn't be associating yourself with them. Um, so you want to create a circle of people around you that are making you better and, and focus on that. And, and, uh, and that's because it's only going to help you. It can't hurt you, right? So. Can you talk about um, how you did that? Or can you give some tips to people how to create a network? So my professional network through the engineering uh, in the engineering world was fairly easy because I was in it and you, you meet people and you, and you grow, grow, you know, organically from there. In the wildlife field, I didn't know anybody, you know, uh, other than just my buddies, you know, that like to, to do the same stuff that I like to do. Um, so I had a friend of mine uh, who uh, uh, owns, has owned a few businesses in her lifetime and stuff. And, and, she, she re is really a big fan of LinkedIn. So she told me, she goes, Ron, I know you're on LinkedIn. He goes, but you, you can reach out to people that uh, in a field that you're interested in and just send them a connect connection request. And don't just send them a connection request. You can add, a I think it's 180 characters. You add something in there, mm -hmm. but you got to be direct, you know, because you, you know, mm -hmm. you, you got to, you know, a small little window to, to say something to sell yourself. So I just what I did. I went out and I just 
literally went on LinkedIn, typed in biologist, you know, and, and a whole bunch of names came up and I just started hitting hundreds of connection requests, you know, with a little blurb, you know, about who I am and what I'm doing and, and I want to build my network and, and lo and behold, some people even reach back out to me and says, Hey, if you need some help or questions, feel free to reach out. And so I even reached out, I had an interview with a, a bio or I interviewed them, asked them questions about the field and stuff. And they gave me pointers on uh, what I should be focused on for school and stuff like that. And uh, so that helped me. So that's what I did. I, I didn't have, I had nowhere to go. So I went to LinkedIn. I created an artificial network there and just literally reached out to hundreds of, of uh, people, biologists, and, and just created a, uh, conversation with with a few of them and then and then grew from there so now you i'm creating didn't... it more organically sorry oh, sorry no and I, I interrupted you and you didn't even ask them anything you just introduced yourself and like you didn't have a request or a question that you asked of them no i didn't ask him any questions i just say hey my name's uh uh Ron Lewis, or i mean I didn't, maybe i didn't have a name and i said hey I'm looking to go back to school changing careers um i'm looking to get any sort of information um, or advice that you'd have on on this school if i should go there or not um and then um and that's it i just and i said i'm just trying to build my network and i hope you uh, accept that. my connection request yeah no it's pretty generic it wasn't anything fancy and i'd say about a third of them connected you know got back and connected me uh, which is pretty good i think yeah, yeah. that's great so i mean you, i mean just like I remember when I was younger in my twenties and stuff, you know, you you'd go out and ask a girl for a date or whatever. And a lot of them would reject you, right? You get used to rejection all the time, right? <laughs> so this is kind of the same thing, you know, but in a different world, you know. So you get used to rejection. And and if they don't respond, don't take it personally, all right? Um, yeah. just yeah, just keep moving forward. So I have a question that maybe you won't be able to answer, but um a lot of people say like this field is about who you know. But I've talked to, well, in my experience, actually, was that um, experience is more important than who you know. I actually had four jobs where I was already working with the people who interviewed me for the jobs, yeah. and I didn't get them because somebody was more experienced. And I right. talked to a couple of um, graduates recently who were who actually were working in a very similar job that was advertised and the people wanted to hire them but they couldn't because somebody with like a, ma a, a master's yeah in both cases right. they had their, their bachelor's and somebody with a master's applied and they had to take the right. master's so right. do you do you feel like like um that's true or do you feel like it's more about who you know i think it's a combination i don't think there's yeah. i don't think there's a cut and dry you know yeah. uh, black and white scenario i think it's 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 a combination of both create your network get the education that you need i mean my boss told me that he couldn't get promoted into the position he's in now because he didn't have a master's degree so he actually went back to school got his master's degree wow and now he's at where he's at right now so i do have to say though um for those of you listening the phd level you like you might have heard about overqualification and that is real at the, at the phd level i that's not true if you get your masters unless you're applying to something like maybe an internship and you have your masters but at the phd i have had that i've had masters graduates apply for internships that no kidding. i kidding mm -hmm. wow yeah wow. Interesting. um so, but PhD, I know for sure I didn't get a job at, at our state um, wildlife agency here be, just because I had a PhD. And that's because um, they don't necessarily want to pay you that much, or they also, um, if, if you're applying for a, a, a master's level job and you have a PhD, a lot of times they think that it's, you can't get another job and that you'll take that job. And then in the meantime, look for a better job and then leave. Mm -hmm. So, um, so really think about it if you want to get your PhD, but masters you're, you're pretty, um, safe with. Um, the, another question I wanted to ask is, um, there's a lot of discussion in this field about, um, volunteering and, I mean, I always advocate for people to volunteer to get experience, but um, a lot of people talk about how that limits who can enter the field because um, you have to be able to support yourself. And some of these tech positions, they're almost like volunteer work. They pay so little. Um, can you, can you, 
Yeah. Can you <laughs> talk, can you talk about that? Like if you didn't have this previous career, would you still be able to enter the job and, and should people like consider working an alternative career first to build up money and then transition into this career? Um, well, for, uh, let me take a small bite of the apple first, uh, the volunteering part. I think if, if you are young and have no experience doing anything, um, volunteering is a great way to get your foot in the door because mm -hmm. a you're going to get some sort of experience and b you're going to start building your network right you start meeting people right and then you're going to um, um, hopefully organically you can grow from there right and that's going to lead to something else right so i don't have any problem with that when i decided to make the leap and commit to it i wasn't looking for volunteer jobs i wasn't I wanted, I wanted to get something that I could get a paid position that I could put on my resume because that had a lot more weight than a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you can, I'm trying to organize my thoughts. If you can get a volunteer position um, of learning how to rebuild small engines at a lawnmower, lawnmower shop, it's a great experience and you can put that in your resume and, that, and that's a pretty good, pretty good thing you know, for volunteering. To learn something, right? some some useful skill, right? Some useful uh, trade business, if you will. That's good. Uh, but volunteering for with your local charity group, like a, uh, Ducks Unlimited or um, the Mule Deer Foundation, right? Great, they're, they're great organizations, and 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 that's great. To, it's fun to help out and uh, with with all those organizations, but not going to help your resume. It's not going to help you get a job. You know, maybe it'll build your network, um, but it's not going to help you get a job. I'm sorry. What was the other question? Um, I can't remember. <laughs> oh, should people? <laughs> sorry, I'm <laughs> listening to your answer so carefully. I was actually. I'll, I do remember the question, but um, right. I'll write it down real quick. Right. Um, but I want. I was. What I was thinking of is that. Um, Another thing to tell people who are struggling to get jobs is if they, if they have, and they're most likely going to have to work to, to, to survive unless they're still living with their parents or something, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but they could get a mechanical job in the meantime, which would give them pay oh, yeah, yeah. and experience. Right. So that's a great way for people to, to do both, um, you know, instead of working at like a fast food restaurant or something like that, where, right. I mean, there, there can be some transition of skills, but, um, right. but as you mentioned, the mechanical skills are so important. I was, I, I asked, um, do you think it might be a good idea for people to start um, a more lucrative career first and then transition right. into this career to build up some fi financial support? I think if you're committed to doing whatever career you want to do, you should go all in and do that. Don't mm -hmm. have a plan B, so to speak. You know, I don't have a plan B. This is what I want to do. I, if this doesn't work out, then I'll retire, I guess, you know, or just live on the street somewhere. I don't know, but <laughs> I am fully committed to doing this. This is what I wanted to do. I, I, my, the way I talk to myself is that I want to be a biologist. This is what I want to do. If you don't have that mindset yet, and you're not fully committed to it, then maybe you should look into something uh, that's, uh, this is, this will help out me in, in the future. Maybe you should look into this as a career. Maybe you should look at something else as a career. <laughs> that way I can get the job. Um, but if you're fully committed, I'd say go for it. I mean, do what you can to gain the experience, uh, get the schooling, all the schooling that you can get, um, and then move forward from there. I don't. The path I took was, uh, I mean, when I was 19, 20, I had no idea I wanted to be a biologist. I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't. Mm -hmm. Never even thought about it. But if you're 19, 18 years old and you want to be a biologist and you're dead set on doing it, go all in, do it. I love that. And, and, yeah. and it seems like you have such a great mindset about it as well. Yeah, I do. Um, there's there's a show I watched, uh, The Marvelous Miss Maisel. And there was a, love a that show. there. Are you watch it? Yeah. <laughs> I haven't yeah. watched the new season yet, though. So don't, no spoilers. Uh, well, there, I'll give you a tiny little spoiler in the new season. There's okay. A, there's a scene. You'll, you'll, it's not going to give anything away. <laughs> but there's a scene in there. One, one of the main characters, his girlfriend, um, she keeps saying that this can't happen to her because she's going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And 
I can't believe this has happened to me because I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. And, and then her boyfriend's like, oh, okay, I get it. You're going to be a doctor. But she, but what I took out of that was she had the mindset, even though she's in school to be a doctor, her mindset was, I'm going to be a doctor. That's what I want to be. Yeah. This, this can't happen to me because I'm going to be a doctor. You know, So hopefully I didn't spoil anything for you. But no. um, but <laughs> when you see it, like you'll it. think of me now. <laughs> but, um, you, sorry, go ahead. But anyways, when she said that, I thought of myself and how I feel about what I'm doing. Right now, so, Z- I, I don't, have you ever seen Zootopia? Zootopia is like that too. The, oh, the main long character, time ago, the main character is a, this little bunny, and the, um, I think she wanted to be a po- police officer. Uh huh. Oh, and um, like all the police officers were these big, like you know, beefy animals. But she would tell herself yeah. like over and over again, that's what she wanted to be. Um, something that I wanted to say or add on to what you said is that um, another option for people is they can have a main career and then have conservation or um, wildlife yeah. biology jobs as their hobby. And a lot of right. people want to go into this career because they want to travel or, um, you know, like go on safari and see these amazing animals. And at the end my book, the last chapter, I talk about how um, this one very prominent, um, conservation biologist that, that I worked with that he, he, like when we were talking about traveling, he's like, yeah, I want to go to, and he mentioned this country he works in. And I was like, you work in that country. And he's like, yeah, but I'm never, I never have like been there. He's like, when I go there, I'm in a meeting room all day. He's like, I'm, I'm, you know, talking to people. I'm not, he's like, I see my, or this is what triggered it. He's like, I see my friends, they're on vacation. They're going to, and he mentioned the country that he works in. They're going to all these beautiful places. They're looking at waterfalls. And yeah, like once you, once you get higher up, you're mostly behind a computer screen and in meetings, you're not doing those things. So maybe um, you should have a, maybe it's a good idea to have a more lucrative career and then save your money. And then, um, there are like really great ecotourism, Mm -hmm. um, programs out there, citizen science programs involve travel, um, that you can, and so you can get, um, your experience as a wildlife biologist. Okay. So I'm taking a lot of time or we're getting close to an hour. So, um, do you have any like final thoughts or advice or just anything else you would you would like to add before we wrap up? I'm, I'm big on uh, on goals. Uh, if you have a goal, um, you know, write down your goal. I mean, writing it literally writing on a piece of paper. I don't even do it on a computer. I literally take a piece of paper and a pen and I write it mm-hmm. out. That that physical motion kind of emphasizes, you know, and builds it, uh, makes it stronger, you know, more concrete, you know, to do that. And then I write it out and then, and then I try, try to do what I can to achieve those goals, you know, so create some goals and try to achieve them. Be my so, so what's your ultimate career goal? Like you said, you want to be a wildlife biologist, but do you have like a vision of like what that looks like, like a, like a certain uh, position or, or um, workplace? Uh, I don't have any anywhere. I, I'm very flexible, so I can go anywhere. Mm-hmm. I can go anywhere in the, in the country, or the world. It, it doesn't matter to me. And, and and technically, I'd be happy just doing seasonal jobs. I have the winters off, so to speak, kind of like the reverse of a teacher, you know, um, mm-hmm. doing that for another 15, 20 years, and then and then calling it you know retirement. Um, but I think that would get old. Um, after a while uh, it's hard it's hard being away it's hard being in a remote area it's hard mm-hmm. having to find a place to stay you know it's hard to you know live on a on, on a small wage you know because the pays aren't I'll, I'll give washington state fish and wildlife kudos i mean their pay is actually pretty good <laughs> for uh for some of the tech positions you know they're, they're not they're not bad at all and um mm-hmm. the last when i worked for one last year i was getting paid almost 30 dollars an hour this one, you know, 17, I think, or something like that. So quite mm-hmm. the pay difference, but I'm kind of rambling, but. Uh, no, you're um, fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, write down your goals and, and try to achieve them. Dude, try to figure out ways to achieve your goals. 
I totally agree. Well, yeah. thank you so much. I had a really great time talking to you and I'm so glad that the podcast inspired you to go on this new career trajectory. Well, thank you. You've been uh, uh, very helpful for me. Uh, I'm sure you probably helped out quite a few people, not just me. So yeah, and it's, I'm sure it's nice for you um, just to hear at least one person that, that mm -hmm. you helped, you know, so, but, so thank you for helping me. So it's been much appreciated. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks again, Ron, for that amazing interview. In the show notes, I'll put a link to Ron's um, social media, his LinkedIn, which you can definitely connect with, connect to with him there. I wanted to just like reiterate a couple of points from this podcast. First, LinkedIn, as I just mentioned, a lot of people talk about not having a network, not being able to go to conferences, uh, either because of money or especially because of COVID. Well, you can do a lot from home as Ron demonstrated. Don't be afraid to reach out to people. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Get a LinkedIn profile. Start doing that today. Another thing I loved at the end when he talked about mindset. Mindset is so huge in this field. Writing things down, writing down, having goals and writing down your goals and believing in them. There is real power when you put pen to paper and there's research behind this. So that's another really great tip. And then finally, I just love the mechanical tip. That's something I really haven't thought of. So use the job tracker. If you don't know what that is, go to fancyscientist.com and search job tracker. It's a spreadsheet. It allows you to organize jobs that you're interested in so you can figure out the exact skills that you need and education and experience you need to get those jobs. So if you start lining up your jobs and you see some sort of like mechanical reference or four-wheel drive or something like that, and you can't get a wildlife biology job, perhaps you can get a job in another field that will give you those skills so then you can transfer them over to your wildlife job and be competitive when applying. So thanks again, Ron, for those amazing tips, and thanks again, everyone, for listening.